let's get this out there. I think the most on point justice right now on the Supreme Court is Clarence Thomas. I don't agree with everything he says. I don't agree with everything he does. But right now, he is the anchor of the Supreme Court team, and he seems to be holding it down. And now, on one of the issues where I think Clarence Thomas has provided some much-needed clarity and sanity to the court, Neil Gorsuch has finally joined him on that team, and it's interesting to see if this becomes a sort of domino effect. And what I'm talking about here is an issue. I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to explain it. We're going to get to all of this. Watch to the end of the video to make sure you get all of this. But it's about revisiting a case from 1964 New York Times versus Sullivan, which has become a critical case in defamation lawsuits. So whether you're talking about the Vic Mignogna lawsuit that we've been watching on this channel or the Project Veritas versus New York Times lawsuit, which you may have heard about, or Chris Avalone, the video game developer who has filed a lawsuit, all of these people uh, have hurdles to overcome because of this one case, New York Times versus Sullivan, which forever changed defamation law back in 1964. Defamation law that had been in place for centuries got transformed overnight and the effects on the ability for people to recover for false statements made about them have been devastating. And so there have been calls by previous justices and most recently Clarence Thomas and now Neil Gorsuch to revisit New York Times versus Sullivan to see if it's even a good idea to have this case hang around. Let's talk about what they said and why they're saying it and why this is such an important and critical discussion to have. I'm Nick Riccata of Riccata Law, a small law firm in central Minnesota. I'm a lawyer. I'm also a legal and political commentator on YouTube and on Odyssey. Wherever you're watching, go ahead, hit like, hit subscribe, Turn on your notifications. Make sure you don't miss any videos. All of that good stuff. Let's let's get into this. Okay, so here's the story. It's from CNN Politics. I'll have it linked down in the description below. And importantly, in that, it links to the Supreme Court opinion document, which I'll also have linked, although it's kind of a pain to navigate. So I'm going to give you all the information here, but I'm going to give you the sources as well in case you want to look into them on, their, on your own. Justices Gorsuch and Thomas call to revisit landmark First Amendment case, New York Times versus Sullivan. Okay, so what is New York Times versus Sullivan? Why does this matter? Why is it a big deal? In 1964, New York Times versus Sullivan was decided. And we're not going to get into the background of the case, but it basically is at the height of the civil rights era, and it involves some uh, publication that um, some... Law enforcement officers from the South are shown in a negative light in regards to race relations in an ad in the New York Times. OK, that's that's what you need to know. And it, that context is really, really important here as well, because these Supreme Court cases are not decided in a vacuum. So they're they're depicted unfavorably in this a particular ad in the New York Times. They sue the New York Times in the Southern state and they end up winning. They end up winning the case and uh, the New York Times was sued for defamation or libel, as it were, and they, uh, they, they got a big recovery. So this goes all the way up to the Supreme Court and they decide, no, that the New York Times did not defame these guys because the New York Times did not publish with something called actual malice. And they created this framework, this framework that says, if you are a public official, this is under New York Times versus Sullivan, if you're a public official, then you have a different standard to prove your defamation versus any other person. So if I want to defame you as a normal person, uh, you know, you have one standard, which is simple negligence. I negligently say something false about you, which causes you harm and causes you damage. And the court can help recover those damages. So, you know, I say some lie about you because I failed to investigate it or whatever. That's, that's the negligence standard here. Now we go to, if this person is a public official, a government worker, a police officer in this case, they're a government worker. You need to show actual malice, which is not merely a failure to investigate, 
but actual knowledge of the falsity or reckless disregard for finding out the truth. So again, beyond just a failure to investigate, but a willful ignorance of the truth or knowledge of the falsity. So they create this thing and they say that because we want robust discussion around our public officials and because of the scary prospect that government agents will use the weight and arm of government and their connections in that government to go after people who say negative things about them, we want to protect people's rights to discuss. So they create New York Times versus Sullivan and this actual malice standard. And then a couple years later, it gets expanded and it gets expanded away from just public officials to now public figures, public figures being like very, very famous movie stars, for example, like a Tom Cruise or, or something like that. We're talking very high level celebrities are considered public figures because basically everybody knows who they are. Taylor Swift, The Rock, Vin Diesel, you know, the pick an A-lister and go ahead. That's that's your idea of a public figure. And then a couple years later, the court expands it again to include a limited purpose public figure, which merely means someone who has injected themselves into a limited aspect of the public so long as the defamatory remarks are in relation to that public appearance. And that gives the courts a ton of leeway to make just about anybody into a public figure when you start considering how broad social media is. Like what, what is public in a group of 500 people, someone who is known by half of that group is arguably a public figure in that group. So when you've got this limited purpose, public figure requirement, you, you've suddenly expanded the amount of people from a lot to a very small amount. It used to be, you had to be, you know, uh, Barbara Streisand to be a public figure. Now you can literally just be guy on the internet, but you're public within a small group of people. You're, you're on a Facebook group with 5,000 people and a whole bunch of people know who you are. You're suddenly public. And I'm not joking. One of the courts held that a guy, uh, a guy who sold jet skis, a jet ski retailer joined an internet chat room for jet ski retailers. And therefore he became a limited purpose public figure in the chat room of jet ski real, uh, 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 retailers. That's insane that there's nowhere near a public figure status. However, that's what the courts have been able to do. And this all stems back to Sullivan. So it's really important to understand why this case exists and why it's such a big deal in defamation law. That's why I'm doing so much expounding upon it. Now, Thomas and Gorsuch are saying, wait a minute, though. This isn't really what the purpose of Sullivan was. And maybe we need to look at rolling things back or at least redefining things in the age of social media. Because Jet Ski Guy is not a public figure by any stretch of the imagination. He's in a small group. Nobody knows who he is outside of this group. He's just a guy who owns a store. And if everybody who owns a store is a public figure, then everybody effectively becomes a public figure because it's so, it's so broad at that term. And then everybody's held to the heightened standard. And once you hit that actual malice standard, it is almost, almost impossible to win a defamation claim. And that's what the justices are looking at here. That's what Thomas and Gorsuch are looking at going, this can't be right. It's important to go back beyond New York Times versus Sullivan because it has been the law since 1964. That's a very long time, right? We're now almost 60 years from the passage of that, of that case. And it has been the law of the land since that time. However, for hundreds of years prior to that, including the entirety of the history of the United States prior to New York Times versus Sullivan, libel and defamation were not protected speech by the First Amendment. You don't have the right to go around and lie about people to destroy their reputations. And you never have. Only when New York Times versus Sullivan comes out do they say that, well, we want to make it, we want to make it a little bit harder. We want to make it a little bit harder, but a little bit harder became a lot harder. And so that's what the issue is here. If you become a public figure, then right now, and we see this with me too, we see this with cancel culture, entire lives and careers are ruined by a series of tweets 
that have no verifiability. There's no fact checking. There's no presumption of innocence. There's nothing. There's nothing to protect the livelihoods and reputations of people right now. Uh, the right tweet from the right account uh, gets picked up by a couple other accounts and suddenly an entire career, an entire life even, there have been people who have killed themselves because of this stuff. It's over. It's over. And we're saying with New York Times versus Sullivan that those people, because they're talked about on the internet, they must be a public figure, right? Because of that, they don't ever get a chance to recover or to protect their name. And the justices are seeing something wrong with it. And I think maybe there's a domino effect coming on the conservative side of the court as we continue to protect people's ability to libel and slander people with impunity. So let's see what the article says here. Clarence Thomas and Neil Gorsuch on Friday said the Supreme Court should revisit the breadth of the landmark First Amendment decision, New York Times versus Sullivan, explore how, explore how it applies to social media and technology companies. The 64 ruling created a high bar for public figures to claim libel and has been a bedrock of U.S. media law, but the two conservative justices said it's time to take another look. Since 1964, Gorsuch wrote Friday, our nation's media landscape has shifted in ways few could have foreseen. He added that thanks to the revolutions in technology, today virtually anyone in this, in this country can publish virtually anything for immediately consumption virtually anywhere in the world. Gorsuch and Thomas wrote uh, as they dissented when the court declined to take up a case from the son of a former prime minister of Albania who claimed several statements were defamatory in a book that was later turned into the Hollywood film War Dogs. Friday was the first time Gorsuch, a nominee of President Donald Trump, joined Thomas's consistent calls to look at the historic ruling. Not only has the doctrine evolved into a subsidy for published falsehoods on a scale no one could have foreseen, it has come to leave far more people without redress than anyone could have predicted. And those two things combined really flush out what's going on here with the justices and what's going on here in popular media. Let me summarize Gorsuch's argument because I don't want to go through like a 10 page uh, decision on this video, but distilling it down. Distilling it down, in 1964, it was really, really hard to widespread publish anything. You either had to have access to a printing press, you had to have access to broadcasting equipment and a license, you had uh, staffs of people um, filling out newsrooms, you had fact checkers, you had a limited other number of news agencies that all purportedly kept each other in check. And I think we can all agree that the news media has changed dramatically today from 1964. How, uh, however that uh, manifests, there are definite differences and definite changes that have happened. And in 1964, the justices thought that news outlets should have some protection to speak out against people with some level of impunity. They should be able to, to engage in robust debate, so long as they were not intentionally and knowingly lying. Remember, that's the actual malice standard. That was the goal behind it. However, now everybody is their own media company. All you need is a Twitter, a TikTok, a YouTube account. Whatever, you can put your message out there for the entire world to consume. It has now become very, very easy to broadcast to literally billions of people. You today have more ability to access the public than the New York Times had in 1964 if you have a smartphone. And that's just the truth. And that's just the truth. And over and over again, we've got people with, with no media background suddenly having more viewership than even the New York Times today, not to mention what they had in 1964. So that's one aspect of it. And Gorsuch is saying that in the interest of pursuing that ability to have robust discussion amongst all of the heightened requirements that it took to have a media uh, company, they, they kind of had these protections so that this could happen. But now, now he's saying that this has fostered the ability for anybody to publish at the same sort of level. And that means that anybody has the ability to defame. And if we've reduced the ability of the person to recover 
for the destruction to their reputation, then we've effectively increased the ability for anybody and everybody to defame, something that has never been protected by the Constitution and something that goes deep, deep into the roots of the English common law. This has not been a thing. People used to be shot in duels over this. The defamation law came in to try and curb the deaths of the uh, caused by duels over uh, lies and slander about someone's good name. And so now we've gutted defamation law and the ramifications of New York Times versus Sullivan could not have been predicted in 1964 when they were passed or when they were when it was decided. That's the gist of Gorsuch's argument is now everybody's a media company and it's time to look at this. Now, of course, this is going to be spun that they they want to overturn New York Times versus Sullivan and make everybody liable for all of the defamation ever and, and allow big companies. That's not what they're saying. That's not what Thomas or Gorsuch are saying in this case. They're simply saying this needs to be revisited and reevaluated under a present media environment rather than pretending we're still in 1964. The law is behind the times and we need to update it. And that is that's a true statement. That is a true statement. And for all of the all of the questions about, well, it's precedent, they shouldn't overturn it because of stare decisis and an unwillingness to overturn precedent. New York Times versus Sullivan is a precedent on its own. It is a precedent unto itself. It was created entirely as a legal fiction in 1964. It does not have roots that predate that. It simply is a desire in the civil rights era, importantly, in the civil rights era, to not allow cops who were anti-black to be uh, to sue for negative press covering them. And that context, that context is really important to the decision. The court there is looking to looking to foster open communications during one of the most contentious and most important public discussions in that in the present day United States of 1964, which is the civil rights movement. And uh, and they saw the actions of government officials in that case working together in sort of an old boy network in, I think, Alabama. And they saw they said, nope, we can put a stop to this. And they did. The ramifications of putting a stop to that have been uh, astronomical and unforeseen. And now it's time to look at it again. So I, I know this is a long video. I know nobody's going to watch it, but please like, subscribe, share, all of that stuff if you found this informative. This is a really, really important to, uh, discussion to have in present day. Again, especially if you're watching the Project Veritas lawsuit very closely where it really looks like the New York Times intentionally defamed Project Veritas and under New York Times versus Sullivan. And this is their argument, by the way. This is the New York Times' argument against Project Veritas as well, is that we can't defame them. They're public figures, and they can't possibly meet the bar of actual malice. Therefore, we get to lie about them, and they can do nothing about it. That's the argument of New York Times. That's why this case is important. Let me know what you guys think down in the description or in the comment section below. I would love to see where you guys are on defamation cases uh, for me. I'd like to see some people get some comeuppance. Until next time, thanks for watching. Peace. Peace.